Good afternoon to all distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Binus University on the sixth Asian series, series of bridges, dialogues towards a culture of peace. It's an honor for us to be here with all of you. My name is Willie, and my partner here, Farah, will be the MC for this remarkable event. Ladies and gentlemen, this event is one of the dialogue series organized by the International Peace Foundation. The dialogue we will have today will be delivered by our distinguished guest, the Nobel Laureate, Professor Sheldon Lee Glesho. Before we start, we will introduce you briefly about the seminar today. The 6th Asian Bridges event series is being held from January to March 2017 in Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. The series is involving the participation of the Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The aim of this event is to establish long-term relationship, resulting in common research programs and other forms of collaboration by enhancing tech science, technology, and education as a basis for peace and development. The events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom, and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation. Asian key to the future. Before we start, let us greet our distinguished guests. With us, Mr. Daniel Benari from the International Peace Foundation. Bapak Bernard Gunawan, CEO of Bina Nusantara. <laughs> Professor Harianto Pabo, as rector of Binus University. <laughs> to all Binusian leaders. To our distinguished guests from our industry partners, university partners, and embassies. To all participants, lecturers, and students. And also to participants that join us through webinar. As an information, together with us there are already more than 500 participants from eight different countries that join us through the webinar. This event is also live streaming through Venus TV. You can access on www.venus.tv. Thank you very much for your presence and participation. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin with, we will together listen to welcoming speech that will be delivered by CEO of Bina Nusantara, Bapak Bernard Gunawan. To Papa Berna, please come up to the stage. Nobel Laureate for Physics, 
Mr. Daniel Bednar, the Director of Event Coordination of the International Peace Foundation. Also, Bina Nusantara Board of Management, Professor Dr. Harjanto Prabowo MM as the Rector of Binus University, uh, Universities, Industries, Schools and Media Partners, High School Students from Binus and other schools, also Binusian leaders, educators and students. Warm welcome and best with you to all. Asian Bridges Program of the International Peace Foundation facilitates communication to promote understanding and trust. The six series taking place in the first quarter of 1917 bring seven Nobel laureates to 12 prestigious Indonesian universities, including Venus University. Global community admire Asian for its rapid boom over the last two decades. Asian is now the seventh largest economy in the world, comprising of ten countries. As power comes with responsibility, the same global community observe Asian cooperation within and with partners across the globe. We must carefully manage the region diversity to employ its social capital for development. With six religions and over 700 dialects, Indonesia, Indonesia embodies this diversity. Legato Institute rank Indonesia among the top countries for the potential of its social capital. For the diversity to turn into capital, we have to ensure we promote the values of our nation has been built on unity in diversity. For this, we must engage in a dialogue with people from different backgrounds. This is why Venus University considers global mindset to be one of the core competencies our students must acquire. 100% of our graduates get international experience by the time they graduate. This bridges even event is one of the many ways we ensure our student engage in discussion across borders. Today, Professor Sheldon L. Glesio awarded Nobel Prize for his contribution to the standard model of particle physics, looks at the history of this scientific field. Along the way, he demonstrates that applied and basic science drive one another in creating technologies used around the world today. While applied and basic science are often perceived as worlds as apart, Professor Sheldon L. Glesio demonstrates the point of mutual influence and co-growth. The visit of seven Nobel laureates to Indonesia is also an inspiration to our country for stronger dedication to impactful research. Venus University is committed to the provision of high-quality education as well as professional knowledge services. We have established a close relationship with the, with the industry one reason is to make sure our students get market 
relevant education. Equally important is to facilitate collaboration for marketable innovations. We must work together to keep strengthening Indonesia's contribution to the world of science and technology through the increasing number of scientific journal published and patent output. I sincerely hope this extraordinary opportunity to speak to Professor Sheldon Leshu will inspire you, educators, researchers, and industry partners to build collaboration across borders in conducting research that drive our society forward in terms of social, intellectual, and economic capital. Dear students, I hereby invite you to pursue advanced degrees and careers in research and development. Thank you, Professor Shalanel Glesio and the International Peace Foundation for this opportunity to host you at Pinus University today. As event sponsors, we show dedication to the mission of the bridge series, which is reflected in our own vision, the world-class knowledge institution in continuous pursuit of innovation and enterprise. <coughs> we are honored to be a part of this event series together with the other prominent Indonesian universities. Join Participation demonstrates mutual dedication to peace and innovation for continued growth of our country and region. We hope this event will help us develop even deeper friendship and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you to Baba Bernan. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will together listen to opening speech that will be delivered by Director and Representative of Events Coordination of International Peace Foundation for Asia, Mr. Daniel Benari. Bridges Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. This, um, Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 20 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities, and I would like to thank Venus University for hosting our event today. Having started in January 2017, bridges will continuously held in Indonesia until March, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for economics, peace, physics, chemistry, and medicine. The sixth ASEAN series of bridges follows the series of over 600 bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in many ASEAN countries since the year 2003 as an independent contribution to the Decade for a, decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly. 48 Nobel laureates, as well as 20 other keynote speakers and artists, including Dr. Hans Blix, Jackie Chan, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, President Romano Prodi, 
the late Dame Anita Roddick, Oliver Stone and Dr. James Wolfenson participated in this event. In Thailand, they were presided over by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit and Her Royal Highness, Crown Princess Malachapri Sirintorn, and reached an audience of about 180,000 participants. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as a single conference, but as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with leaders in all parts of um, society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 145 other national and inter international organizations and institutions, including 75 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Singapore, and of the events now in, in the Indonesia reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, as well as the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families and our environment starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of corporate cooperation and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. A globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. So let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer an opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected and comprehensive view of ourselves and the world in which we live and in which we are able to create a new constantly through dialogues towards a culture of peace which needs the participation of everyone. I thank the 1979 Nobel laureate for physics, Professor Sheldon Klarschau, who has agreed to come to Indonesia to support the events and we now look forward to his speech and to his important con contribution to the bridges. So welcome, Professor Klaasham. Thank you to Mr. Daniel. Ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to introduce you the moderator for this dialogue. She is our lecturer and associate professor of our computer engineering department. She is also our leader of research interest group in photonics and computer systems. Her current research is laser induced breakdown spectroscopy and computer engineering. Without any further ado, please join us to welcome Dr. Linda Henry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to present Professor Lee Glasser. Thank you. 
Before we start, should I give a short description about you yourself? I would like to introduce you with the audience. Introduce, introduce you with the audience, to the audience. Is it okay? I have no idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just read this short. No, no, I want to introduce you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, sure. It will be a short description about Professor Sheldon Lee Glashow was awarded the 1979 Nobel Prize for Physics together with the late Professor Abdul Salam and Professor Stephen Weinberg for their complementary efforts in formulating the electroweak theory, which explains the unity of electromagnetism and the weak force. For short, most recently, Professor Glashow has devised novel tests of Einstein's Fisher theory of relativity, proposed an integrated form of the neutrino mass matrix, and has excluded the possibility of a universe that is matter antimatter symmetric. Let us now welcome Professor Shedder Lee Glashow to present his talk. It's on. It's on. Yeah, you speak louder, Professor. Speak louder? Okay, I'll speak louder. Okay. Finally, I get to speak. Now, let me first uh, thank you. Uh, many people, especially uh, Bridges and the International Peace Foundation, Venice University, and others who have made this trip possible for me and my wife to come to this glorious and fascinating country, Indonesia. We have never been here before, and it is really quite fascinating and wonderful. Now, this morning, when I was at Venice School, one of the younger students asked me, more or less, what is the relationship between science and peace? And uh, perhaps I didn't give the right answer at that time, but I was thinking about that question from a very young student. And the, it comes to mind that science is the most international of all disciplines. Countries that are at war with each other, that hate one another, still cooperate scientifically. Remember, during the time of the uh, conflict between the West and the Soviet Union, uh, there was great fear in the world about nuclear war. But all during those years, scientists in the Soviet Union and in the United States were in communication with each other, were visiting one and each one when possible, visiting each other, and we're collaborating on problems of science. There are over a hundred countries that cooperate with one another at CERN, the European uh, Laboratory for Particle Physics. <laughs> science is truly international, and we get along with everybody in science. Now, I'll be talking today about how basic science drives technological progress and uh, vice versa. We will also speak of the converse of how discoveries in technology can lead to progress in basic science. Discoveries that are made in science can be intentional or accidental. Some technological advances, such as those of x-rays and penicillin, arose from research that was unplanned and not directed toward any specific goal, let alone a useful goal. These discoveries were unexpected 
and stumbled upon by accident. Other discoveries, like streptomycin or nuclear weapons, resulted from carefully planned and specifically targeted research. Both are valid forms of scientific endeavor. The history of science shows that both methods are essential. And I say this because it must be borne in mind by asp aspiring scientists and by governments, acad academies, and industrial agencies that seek to foster scientific and technological progress. There are two roads to discovery. Immanuel Kant taught us uh, the so-called scientific method. Uh, and let me compare the scientific method with serendipity. The word serendipity comes from a story called The Three Princes of Serendip, uh, which was written hundreds of years ago. Some scientists focus on well-defined goals. First they lay careful plans, then they look. They follow the scientific method. I call this the Kantian approach, following Immanuel Kant. Others have a lot more fun. They look and they listen to nature with open minds, and sometimes they discover amazing things, unexpected things. I call this the serendipitous approach. Like Columbus's discovery of America. But, I mean, he set out to find China, but discovered America instead. And unlike Magellan, who formulated a successful plan to sail around the world, and his boats did just that, although he himself did lost his life someplace around here, as I remember. The two approaches often mix. Many Kantian efforts yield surprising discoveries. TNT was synthesized in 1863 and used as a yellow dye for 28 years until its value as an explosive was discovered. Thalidomide was originally used as a sedative for women, pregnant women, in the 1950s in Europe. And it led to a medical disaster. However, much later, thalidomide is used again as a very effective drug for, can for treating certain, ki certain kinds of cancer and leprosy. There's another dichotomy. Basic science can proceed either by intentional means, Kantian means, or serendipitous, serendipitous, act through serendipity. But there's a second dichotomy. Basic research can be pure, driven solely by curiosity, or applied and dedicated to some specific societal, commercial, or military need. Let me give some examples. A PK means pure and Kantian the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN back in 2012, or the remarkable discovery of gravitational waves just uh, a year ago. Those were examples of pure science. The Higgs boson is not useful. Gravitational radiation is not very useful. And these were very Kantian, very much following the scientific method. What about discoveries that are pure and accidental? 1932, the year I was born, positrons were discovered, quite by accident, pure science. In 1985, buckyballs were discovered. These are molecules consisting of 60 or so carbon atoms arranged in the form of a football. Another serendipity of this discovery in pure science. Or you can have applied science, which can proceed in a Kantian wet method. For example, a Japanese scientist through dedicated 
Plan's research discovered blue LEDs, which made possible the revolution in lighting that we experience today. Or in China, China received its first Nobel Prize, a Chinese person received the first Nobel Prize in the sciences uh, in that night, uh, recently uh, by the, through the discovery of a medicine emerging originally out of uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, for, uh, for uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, this my mind for. Anyway, uh, and we also have well, the final category is uh, applied and serendipitous research, such as the discovery of graphene, and such as the discovery of the giant magneto-resistive effect, uh, which you've probably never heard of, but that was the discovery that enabled all of a sudden disk drives in your computers to have gigawatt, gigawatt memories. There was a tremendous jump in the capabilities of laptop computers due to that discovery, which was an applied and serendipitous discovery. Chemists make lots of accidental discoveries, and I'll give some examples. Uh, these discoveries were both, all of them, applied and serendipitous. They were all found through people who were trying to make money. Uh, but they, people didn't discover what they thought they wanted to discover. Chance, chance favors only the prepared mind, uh, said Pasteur. And the Roman general said, you must by skill make good of what has fallen by chance. So here's a list of, whoops, a list of dyes. Uh, the Prussian, these are all dyes that remain in current use. Uh, 1704, the dye Prussian blue was discovered when somebody uh, was playing around uh, looking for something quite different, but using very cheap ingredients that were contaminated came up with this new dye, which became very important. Uh, I'm not going through all of these, but I have to mention the discovery of mauve. It was discovered by an 18-year-old kid who wanted to become a chemist. And uh, he, a German, a rather older, mature German scientist, came by perhaps spending his sabbatical in England and told this young man, that he should try to synthesize quinine, which was, would become a very important drug for, for treating malaria. And uh, he tried, by the destructive distillation of wood, to create the beautiful white crystals of, of, of quinine. Of course, he couldn't succeed. Quinine would not be synthesized for another 100 years or so. Uh, by some Americans at Harvard University uh, during the, at the time of the Second World War. But instead, when he tried to synthesize the white crystals of quinine, he made a mess, a stinking mess from the spilling wood. But he noticed in this smelly mess a certain purple color. And he extracted a dye from that mess was the first aniline dye, became known as mauve. It was worn by the Queen of England. It was worn by the Empress of France in the Second Empire. Uh, it became a very popular drug. He became a very rich man. The accidental discovery of the first aniline dye, followed by the accidental discovery of the second uh, aniline dye, magenta which incidentally was named after a battle, uh, but that, that's another issue which we will not discuss. <coughs> TNT, we mentioned, a synthetic indigo. How were they discovered? Somebody, in one case, in the discovery of, of uh, synthetic indigo, it was a broken thermometer which released mercury into the mixture, and that mercury enabled, was, uh, was a catalyst that enabled the synthesis. But similarly with sweets, here we have the, a list of one, two, three, four, five, six artificial sweeteners, all of them commercially used in one place or another, saccharine, cyclamates, aspartame, 
acesulfate. Acesulfate is the secret behind Coke Zero, uh, which is, I don't like it, but it's <laughs> uh, Sucralose, which is a chlorine uh, compound of, of sucrose and tagatose. All of them accidentally come discovered. Chance follows the prepared mind. They're looking for one thing. In one case, they were looking for a medicine for heart disease. Instead, they found an artificial sweetener. Everybody was happy. They had lots of money. <laughs> Beyond the rainbow, I talk now about the electromagnetic spectrum. We all learned about, have learned, those of you who study science, about electromagnetism. Uh, the most conspicuous form of electromagnetic radiation is, of course, light, visible light. And I mentioned here uh, that it was Isaac Newton who, in a very systematic way, showed that light can be broken up into the seven primary colors. Incidentally, the, the, it's interesting to ask why there are seven primary colors, and it was Newton came very close to discovering the, uh, the, 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 uh, the wave nature of light. But he didn't believe that light was a wave. He believed that light was a particle. But there were hints of wave-like properties. And it seemed to him that there was something musical associated with light, and that there were seven colors because there are seven notes in the diatonic scale. <laughs> William Herschel, a famous astronomer, became curious about why it is when you go to the beach, you feel the warmth of the sun. <coughs> he knew that sunlight consisted of the seven primary colors that Newton had mm. identified. But which color? carried the heat of the sun. <coughs> and the way he did this is he, like Newton, split light up into its seven colors and put thermometers down to see which color heated things up, got hotter in sunlight. And he found that the thermometer that was accidentally put to the wrong side of red got hot. He accidentally discovered infrared radiation. Whereas his contemporary, Johann Ritter, when he heard about the discovery that Herschel made, realized that there very likely had to be something funny at the other side of the electromagnetic spectrum. And thus, in a Kantian fashion, discovered ultraviolet radiation. Then we have the accidental discovery of X-rays and the accidental discovery of the cosmic microwave radiation. We are all creatures of electromagnetism. In everything we see, in everything we feel, in everything we hear, in everything we smell, taste, or do, has to do with electromagnetism. It's electromagnetism that gives the material properties of matter their solidity. We are electromagnetic. Magnetic. We are electromagnetic creatures. For the theory of electromagnetism, we are indebted to serendipitous discoveries by Galvani, who did some fascinating experiments with frogs, uh, and that led to the discovery of the electric battery, which made possible all kinds of practical discoveries. Uh, Ersted, who during the course of giving a lecture on physics, accidentally discovered that electric currents produce magnetic effects. He wasn't looking for anything like that, but he was the first person to realize that there is an intimate connection between electricity and magnetism. Here's a list of some of the people. When you study electromagnetic theory, you hear about Ampere and Leo, Leo Savard, Coulomb, Faraday, Franklin, all of these characters, Tesla, Volta, Ersted, and well, most these people all did made major contributions to the theory of electricity and magnetism. 
but they didn't make, except for Tesla, who tried to make a lot of money and fails. They didn't, went, weren't out to make money. They were out to discover the nature of physics. They didn't, instead of getting money, they got to be units. Each of them is a unit that uh, is a measure of something or other. Volta gave us the volt. Tesla is a measure of the strength of a magnet. Uh, so is a Gilbert, a Gauss, all of these things. Coulomb is a unit of electric charge, and Ampere is a unit of electric current. Uh, that's all they got out of it. It's eternal thing. Not so bad. <laughs> Here I talk about the virtues of basic science in medicine. And there are so many of them. X-rays discovered accidentally. Didn't take long before it was realized that you could use X-rays to tell whether you, you had a cavity in your teeth. Or during the First World War, to find the bullet that had lodged in somebody's body and remove it. Positrons were discovered accidentally in 1932. Today, they're the basis for PET scanners, the positron electron tomography, which are used throughout the medical profession. And that's interesting, because all the scanners that are used, CAT scanners, PET scanners, MRI scanners, you go to a hospital and get a scan. Well, you can get any one of three kinds of scans. I've never had a PET scan, but I've had a CAT scan and an MRI scan for one thing or another. They all resulted from discoveries in pure science, in basic science. Without the discovery of nuclear magnetism at Harvard in 1950, there could not have been MRI scanners. Without the discovery of radioact radioactive isotopes, there could not have been many forms of medical therapy, brachytherapy being one of them. Without the discovery of the cyclotron, there would not be particle beam therapy, for, again, you, largely for cancer. Without lasers, or you couldn't have your, those of you who wear eyeglasses, can take off your glasses if you have laser surgery. In fact, I just had laser surgery on my eyes, so I can read without glasses for the first time in my life. I had to wear glasses since I was four years old. I no longer need my glasses. That was just two weeks ago, by the way. <laughs> uh, the polymerase chain reaction, something in biology, uh, that led to, the, to so many things. It led to the, to the understanding of the human genome. And it, it is very important, for example, in forensic medicine, in using medicine to tell whether a perpetrator is guilty or not. Penicillin accidentally discovered the structure of DNA itself, accidentally discovered leads to gene therapy. So many things in medicine came about accidentally. And by the way, of these, each of these basic discoveries led to a Nobel Prize. Basic science and IT. IT is very important these days. Many of you study. Uh, information technology, robotics, computer science. Uh, what have, uh, here are some ways in which basic science affected information technology. First, through the very, very Kantian discovery of radio waves led to wireless transmission. The discovery of holography, which now all of our credit cards have little holographs on them, which make them more secure. So we are told the discovery of transistors led to the first computer revolution. The discovery of integrated circuits led to the second computer revolution. Today, we have been revolutionized by computers. Today, I cannot go to a restaurant and observe lovers having a dinner together because the lovers are each looking at their, their own cell phones. Everybody. I can't walk the streets of my city because you have students walking along reading their <laughs> cell phones and bumping into me. And so it goes. I mentioned the giant magneto-resistive effect, which led to gigabyte disks, 
uh, high temperature superconductivity, which made possible MRI scanners. The World Wide Web, the World Wide Web, which is the basis to today's information age, was devised and deployed by physicists for physicists. But it caught on to other people as well. And by the 1970s, we were starting to, we, we in, the, in the physics world were, were beginning to use email with one another. And soon afterwards, everybody is using email and Twitter and all those other things all following from basic discoveries of one sort or another. Quantum manipulation may someday lead to a new generation of computers called quantum computers. computers. Perhaps so. Again, most of these things, of these basic discoveries, led to Nobel Prizes. And so it goes. I can go on forever. The photovoltaic effect. The fact that light can make electricity was discovered in 1839 by the father of the person who discovered radioactivity. And uh, that led eventually to solar panels and perhaps to a solution to the energy crisis. The photoelectric effect was first understood by Einstein in 1905 and that led to CCDs, which are the basis to the cameras that you all carry about on your phones. General relativity made possible GPS. Matter waves discovered in some of the Frenchman's thesis in 1923 uh, made possible the electron microscope. Nuclear fission led to nuclear power. And nuclear power may, may save us from global warming and climate change. Charge coupled devices led to digital cameras. Buckyballs uh, led to something called photodynamic therapy very recently. That was a recent application of buckyballs. Graphene, which is a big deal and also won a Nobel Prize, a, a two-dimensional form of carbon. Well, it doesn't have any applications yet that I know of. Now, sometimes it takes a while before a discovery in basic science leads to a practical device. The GMR, the, the giant magnetoresistive effect, which was simultaneously discovered by a French and German scientist, uh, led to giga gigabyte hard drives. It took only three years before that happened. IBM jumped into the game and developed the first uh, gigabyte drives. The CCD, CCDs charge coupled devices to the digital camera took six years. Transistor to transistor Walkman radios, which were the first generation of transistor radios, took seven years. Matter waves to the electron microscope took 10 years. Radio waves to, the, to Marconi and the first wireless telegraphy took 11 years. Fishing to nuclear power took 19 years. General relativity, the GPS, took 78 years, and photovoltaics, the solar panels, took a full 115 years. And of course, there are reasons for that delay. Uh, it could be a question of necessity. Uh, we, we didn't develop solar panels until we needed solar panels. We didn't synthesize uh, uh, quinine until we had to synthesize quinine during the Pacific War between Japan and America and other countries as well. Uh, missing technology, well, you can't simply use general relativity to make GPS unless you had satellites and modern electronics. And so it goes. Let's talk about isotopes from pure to practical. Atoms come as isotopes, as you all know, uh, with almost identical chemi chemical properties for different masses. Some isotopes are radioactivity, radioactive, and they were first found by Saturn in 1912. Some isotopes are stable, and they were first found by J.J. Thompson in 1913, over 100 years ago. 
the discovery of the neutron enabled nuclei to be characterized by two integers. So now I give you a quick lesson in nuclear physics from A to Z. There are two numbers you have to understand. One is A, which is the atomic mass unit, the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus, and Z, which is the number of protons in the atomic nucleus. If you understand A and Z, you have an introduction to nuclear physics. Hydrogen, for example, has, as you all know, three isotopes. All have Z equal one. Ordinary hydrogen is just has a nucleus, which is just a proton. Hemihydrogen, discovered by Harold Uri, Harold Uri in 1933, uh, has, or 32, is a stable isotope of hydrogen with A equals to two. Its nucleus is one proton.